Welcome to today's uh, Non-Destructive Characterization Institute seminar. Uh, and I am going to introduce Steve Azevedo, who will be uh, introducing the speaker for today. Steve? Hello, and uh, thank you, Harry. Uh, for those who don't know me, I'm a retired consultant, uh, having helped Harry form the Non-Destructive Characterization Institute back in, in 2014. NCI's goals uh, all along, uh, have been um, with our academic and government and industrial partners to uh, understand the internal physical uh, properties of an object without causing damage. It's, it's more than detecting blips and signals and making images, but it's really about characterizing objects using many forms of active and passive measurements like EM and acoustic waves and particles, along with physics-based analysis. Well, our speaker today, Dr. Anthony Azevedo from University of Washington, will talk about similar kind of work that he's doing in the area of neuroscience. They're studying neuron and muscle interactions um, at the cellular level in, in fruit flies using really novel imaging methods that I thought would be interesting to this group, um, as well as invasive behavioral measurements like uh, measuring the electronic spikes from a single neuron in a living fruit fly's brain, uh, while well, just responding to a stimulus. That's something you can't do very well with humans. So Tony's going to speak about their recently published work uh, in collaboration with Harvard University and the European Secretron facility in France, both of which have these incredible, uh, very high resolution, unique 3D imaging systems that he's going to talk about. Uh, he'll also talk about a, a, another paper that's being submitted now for publication. So we're hearing a kind of news on that. Um, if you have any questions for him, uh, we've asked Tony to set aside a few minutes at the end, or you can type them into the chat. We'll be monitoring that. Uh, Dr. Esvito's bio is in the seminar announcement, so I won't go into and take up much more time. Um, but he also happens to have been a, at the Lawrence Livermore Lab as a summer student in NIF in the early 2000s. So we'll give him some credit for the ignition shot in December, a little, a little bit of credit. He help us also happens to be my son, so uh, so I love to hear about his work. We thank you, Tony, for speaking with us today, and welcome and take it away. All right, thank you, Dad, <laughs> for the introduction, um, and thank you all for being here. Uh, just checking to make sure you can hear me. Great, awesome. Um, yeah, it's a great pleasure to be here and to talk about some of our work. Um, there's a lot of personal connections here. Uh, Harry has known our family for a long time. Um, we were just remembering uh, his visits to Grenoble. Grenoble, France, the European Synchrotron Research Facility will feature in this talk, but um, Harry came to visit us while we were over there. Um, and, uh, and like Dad said, I spent some time at the lab after college before coming up here where I worked on machine vision and image segmentation problems. Um, uh, so, like I said, it's a great pleasure to be here, but there's also scientific connections that I hope will capture uh, your interests. Um, and so I'm, I'm excited to present our recent projects using really novel imaging uh, and machine vision technologies to develop comprehensive maps of the neural control of muscles in Drosophila. Okay, so I said our projects, who is, who is we? Um, so I'm a research scientist in the lab of John Tuthill at the University of Washington. Um, and uh, this is his, our lab. Um, and uh, this work is really thanks to a close collaboration that John has forged with Wei Chung Allen Lee, a researcher at Harvard Medical School and Boston Children's. And um, in particular, his former graduate student, Jasper Phelps, who was um, instrumental in capturing these data sets that uh, are shown up here. Um, and in particular on the left hand, the left hand one uh, is thanks to uh, some collaborations with Alexandra uh, Pakiranu, um, a physicist at the uh, European Synchrotron Research Facility in Grenoble, France. Um, okay, and then my role in this project has been to combine the information that we got from both of these uh, data sets to address questions that our lab is interested in, uh, namely how the nervous system controls movement. That is um, what we call sensory motor control. And um, I'm gonna assume kind of zero neuroscience knowledge, but infinite intelligence. Uh, and I'm gonna spend a little time talking about what, uh, how we think about um, the neural control of movement. Then I'm gonna introduce uh, these two data sets 
um, and then talk at the end of the talk uh, for a bit about what we're getting out of the connection between these two data sets. Okay, so um, you know, fascination with how the nervous system controls movement really goes back to the beginning of imaging technology. So, um, photography had been around for a little while, but early uh, experiments trying to invent cinematography or the cinema um, uh, were immediately directed at understanding movement. So um, Edward Moybridge famously uh, captured the running of horses and settled a long standing bet that uh, horses did not touch the ground during galloping. And he also captured images of himself. And these early uh, efforts inspired um, a pioneering uh, physiologist in Russia named Nikolai Bernstein to develop his own cinematographic techniques um, and a primitive or an early motion tracker. Actually, nothing had really changed. Nothing has really changed about motion tracking um, until the past decade or so. Uh, since his invention, he used light bulbs to put to capture the movements of craftsmen as they were um, swinging a hammer to hit chisels. Um, and uh, Bernstein was a, a great thinker. Um, and like many great thinkers, his real gift was being able to frame um, uh, frame a problem uh, in an indelible way so that future generations uh, would be inspired by to, to study this more. So one of the things he, so here are two things that he thought about motor control. So the first, he thought of uh, dexterous movement, dexterity as kind of the hallmark of uh, the neural control of movement. And uh, he defined dexterity as motor wit or uh, the ability to find a motor solution to any emerging motor problem. Uh, so as an example, um, we often uh, just consider you know, trying to look at your watch. You know, we often take the other hand and move the sleeve out of the way so we can look. Um, but if you're holding a cup of coffee, you instead would kind of pop your sleeve and then look. Um, and in both cases, you're raising your arm and the first muscle you need to contract when you do that is your calf muscle, actually, so that you anticipate the change in the center of gravity as you move your limbs. Um, so this illustrates that um, uh, finding a motor solution, anything, even simple things, requires a sequential contraction of muscles across the body. So the second thing that Nikolai Bernstein um, uh, said that kind of captures this, uh, he really was fascinated by how the nervous system copes with all of these degrees of freedom. How or how does it find a good way to solve any particular motor problem? And just to put some numbers on that, the human body has 360 joints, it has 600 muscles, and it has half a million motor neurons. So motor neurons are the neurons that go out of the central nervous system to the muscles. And uh, this seems like a lot, but it's a minuscule fraction of the um, close to 100 billion neurons that are in our, our, our nervous systems. Um, and yet they're the critical link between the nervous system and the body. And most of those motor neurons are in uh, the spinal cord uh, and it's protected by um, vertebrae, or as my brother used to call it, the doctor, uh, he would call it the backbone. Uh, mainly to uh, annoy his uh, attending uh, re people at the um, during his residency, his attending physicians. Um, okay, so since these early pioneering efforts to understand motor control, we've made a lot of progress, um, but we still don't understand fundamental things. Uh, for example, um, how activity in the brain makes it into the spinal cord and how motor commands to say move your arm or find your watch get translated into patterns of muscle activations and so our approach in the Tuthill lab is to look at an animal that's um, numerically at least a little bit simpler than humans and that's uh, the fruit fly so here's a here's a fruit fly walking on a spherical treadmill so it's a, about a centimeter uh, it's a foam ball about a centimeter in diameter and it's supported on a small column of air um, and the fly is tethered and moving this, uh, this spherical treadmill around. Um, so flies are very agile walkers. They actually walk at a frequency, they step at a frequency of 10 hertz. So they go quite quick. This is slowed down uh, over 10 times. Um, and you might say, okay, great, this is locomotion. This is kind of a periodic behavior, uh, but is this dexterity? 
Um, and a naturalist would say that to find dexterous behavior, you have to, you really have to go look in the, in the wild. And so here's an insect that is um, out in the wild, uh, my backyard. Um, here's a, a wasp uh, that is navigating difficult terrain, uh, unstable objects that are about the size of itself. Um, it's walking backwards and it's uh, simultaneously trying to do uh, some other task, which is to remove the head of this dead soldier fly and uh, fly off with it. Okay, so how does the nervous system control this kind of behavior? Um, uh, so flies and wasps have very similar nervous systems. Here's um, the head of a fruit fly. Uh, the brain is in the head. Uh, and then it's connected to the ventral nerve cord or the VNC. And the motor neurons that control the leg and the wings are located in the VNC. Um, their dendrites where they get input um, uh, is in these balls. There's one ball per um, per leg and then one ball for uh, the abdomen and then another section where the wing motor neurons are. Um, and we call these balls approximately, uh, we call them neuropills, so I might mention that. So these motor neurons get input from their respective motor uh, neuropills and then send a cable out into the periphery uh, that we call an axon. And the axon then targets a set of muscle fibers um, these action potentials, impulses, electrical impulses, um, travel down these axons. Uh, they cause the release of neurotransmitter at the terminals, which then go and attach to receptors in the muscle and um, open the receptors, which excite the muscle and cause contraction. Okay, so here's where Drosophila really comes in handy. You are probably familiar with the fact that the genetic tools for Drosophila are, um, are very advanced. Um, but here's the kind of thing we can do. We can actually um, find fly strains in which we can genetically label individual motor neurons. Um, and it would be the same motor neuron in each fly that we looked at. So here are three different fly strains that label three different motor neurons that um, go to the femur. Um, and you can tell that they're, they range in size in these axons. The, the, um, the action potential would come down these axons and come to these terminals to cause contraction. All right, and then using these tools, we can then do an experiment that's impossible in vertebrates, um, which is we can express a, a green fluorescent protein in, um, in the neuron, and then using fluorescence microscopy, we can target an electrode to the cell body of the soma, or the cell body of the neuron, also called the soma, um, and then measure the electrical signals in the cell. Um, and so that looks something like this. So here is a, a, a fruit fly. It's positioned on its back. Its femur uh, is glued down and its tibia is free. And then um, positioned on the tibia is this force probe, which we're tracking with this red dot. Um, and you can see this muscle contraction. Uh, that muscle contraction follows this, uh, here's the electrical recording from the cell. You can see this, um, this signal here, we call it a depolarization. The neuron reaches a certain threshold and then it fires this action potential waveform that's right there. That action potential travels out the axon, which we can record on a different uh, electrode right there, causes contraction of the muscle, which you can see in the video, and this twitch force. And then we can measure that same, uh, we can do the same experiment in multiple flies and measure the force produced per number of spikes, so one, two, et cetera, uh, in multiple flies. And so this fast neuron here, this big one, um, produces per, for one spike um, about 10 micronewtons at the tip of the tibia. Um, that's approximately the weight of the fly. So that would essentially be like me curling my entire family with just a single impulse uh, from one motor neuron. Um, but then what you can also see is that these three motor neurons produce um, uh, a wide range of forces, three orders of magnitude difference between this big axon and this smaller axon. Okay. Um, the fly is also still alive during these experiments, so it can also behave on its own. And that looks something like this. So here is a, a period where the fly is moving its own leg. Um, and I'm recording from 
one cell in the cell body and recording the action potential of a separate identified cell um, in the leg. So you can simultaneously record the activity of both neurons as the fly is moving its legs around. Okay, and this gives you a sense of what the motor, what the nervous system must be doing in order to create movement. It's controlling the temporal activation patterns of sets of motor neurons to uh, create these movements. Um, and Bernstein was a contemporary, or a contemporary of, um, of Norbert Wiener. Um, and around that time, it was a beginning to be appreciated that uh, control of movement required feedback, uh, which was led to the, the field of cybernetics. Um, but the exact circuits that are controlling and taking sensory signals and controlling motor neurons have remained pretty much a black box due to their complexity and scale. And the best that we uh, have done so far is essentially the experiments that I just showed you, except blindly poking around to different neurons um, and asking how their activity affects motor neurons and how external stimuli affect those motor neurons. Any questions? Okay. I just heard uh, some input. Okay. I will continue. Okay. But since then, um, we now have tools that make it possible to do much better. Um, and I'm going to show you um, how we're addressing two questions here. So the first thing we'd like to know is which motor neurons connect to which muscles that would um, uh, really allow us to start to parse these circuits. And the second question is which premotor neurons connect to each motor neurons. And the answer to both of these questions is two novel maps. Uh, the first one is called the projectome. How do motor neurons project out of the central nervous system to muscles? And the second map is called a connectome. Um, which is what are the connections between neurons within the nervous system? Okay, so that's um, an introduction to the kinds of questions that we're trying to ask in our lab. Um, and to address this, I want to uh, introduce you to this data set that uh, we gathered at the um, at the ESRF. And this is kind of why I'm here today. Um, and to gather this data set, we worked with um, Alexandra Pakiranu, who unfortunately wasn't able to. Um, to attend this and tell you more about the instrument itself. And uh, uh, we also worked with Peter Clotens, who has um, designed and built this instrument over the last several decades. And that's that's uh, this uh, beamline ID 16A, which is dedicated to these nano CT experiments. Okay, so most of the um, most of the beamlines are located within uh, the ESRF building. And so here, each one of these are individual beam lines dedicated towards um, uh, X-ray imaging technology, um, uh, structures of biomolecules, structures of catalysts, um, all kinds of things. And but uh, these experiments require a very coherent X-ray beam. Uh, and so this experiment is located across the across the road, down a very long hallway, uh, about 200 meters from the undulator source. Um, and at the end of that hallway is uh, the experimental hutch where the submarine, as they call it, is located. And here's Peter uh, and here's Alexandra. Um, and the submarine is an ultra high vacuum contain, uh, uh, chamber uh, that has cryo capabilities. There's a scintillator uh, designed in house at the ESRF, um, a couple to a fast readout, low noise scientific CCD camera. Um, the sample kind of is goes into this tube up here and then is dropped down into the submarine. Here's Alexandra loading sample into that tube. Um, and at the, uh, so here's what that pin looks like. And at the very tip of the pin is our sample uh, embedded in resin. So here's a fly leg and here's the thorax of the fly. Um, so to gather this, info, this um, uh, these data, the, um, you know, the instrument uses um, hard X-rays, 33 uh, keV. Uh, it's the beam is focused with a pair of orthogonal uh, lenses, these Kirkpatrick Bayes uh, mirrors, down to a spot of uh, 15 nanometers across, which is the smallest that they've achieved at the at the facility so far. The beam then diverges and passes through the sample. Uh, the flux is around 10 to the 11th photons per second, uh, but that that was before uh, the facility went through an upgrade, which um, uh, I don't exactly know how much more, but that's been since COVID, uh, so it's it's significantly brighter now. 
Um, okay, so the, the holograms that you get on the scintillator are captured over here. This is normalized to the empty beam with no sample inside of it. Uh, you can see some structure there. Um, at each distance here, uh, it's the sample is rotated and uh, 2000 holograms are taken. Um, the four different distances give you the phase information that you need to then compute the tomograph. And the fly leg is, is kind of the fly leg is is the perfect size for this. It's big enough. Um, uh, 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 we, we can get a lot of resolution there, but it's still small enough that we can capture the entire structure with only 10 of these tomographs. So it took about 3 days to image the entire volume um, and Jasper was there um, imaging overnight uh, the entire week. So the initial results here were published um, a little while ago, along with other data sets. Um, of neural tissue from mouse cortex. All right, so if you stitch together all these 10 tomographs, you get the following volume. So here, here out here, I've um, illustrated the outline of the exoskeleton of the fly. And then you can see the tissues uh, that we see as we go through this volume. And for example, um, right here, you can see the nerve carrying sensory information back to the nervous system. The nervous system is here, the VNC, uh, and motor axons out into the periphery. Um, and here you can see it meet up right there. And then this is the nervous system over here. And then these are cylindrical tomographs. So you're watching kind of the edge of the cylinder as you're going through in Z. Um, so if we take a cross section through the femur of the leg, you can see uh, some of the tissue that we can observe. Um, first, this is the edge of one of these cylindrical tomographs that you see here. And the stitching, this um, instrument is incredibly precise in positioning the, uh, the sample. So stitching this together is actually very trivial. You just align them according to the displacement um, that you needed for each sample or for each tomograph. Um, here in the middle, we can see the nerve, again, carrying sensory and motor information. Uh, this big hollow tube is a blood vessel, which we call a trachea in flies. Um, these are individual muscle fibers. Uh, and then we can also find the tendons, these long black ribbons, and then identify the tendons that each muscle fiber connects to, to make up an entire muscle. So muscles are made of individual muscle fibers, which you can see here. Um, Okay, and then we can even see when motor neurons leave the nerve. So this pair of motor neurons here is leaving the nerve right around here and entering this, um, this muscle. Okay, so using this non-destructive technique, uh, we were able to count the number of muscle fibers we see. And so here, here they are, um, and they're colored according to whether we think the muscle is involved in pulling the fly forward during stance phase, and those are blue, or whether they're involved in um, extending the leg out to start a new step, which we call the swing phase, and those are in orange. Um, in yellow are the muscles that control the claw at the very tip of the, of the tarsus. And then in red are muscles, we don't actually know what their function is. This joint that they seem to control uh, is thought to be fused. And yet there are muscles and there are motor neurons that innervate those muscles. And so we have a biological mystery that we look forward to figuring out. Um, but we were also able to find where the motor neurons at least leave the nerves. Um, so we were able to count those exit points. We weren't able to trace them all. The resolution wasn't quite good enough, but we were able to find that there were 67 motor neurons in this data set. Uh, we were able to count the number of muscle fibers per muscle. And in total, um, there are 16 muscles depicted here, and then there are the two extra that control the tarsus for 18 muscles total within the leg. Okay, and we've also used the data set uh, to examine the sensory structure that measures the angle of the femur tibia joint. Um, and that's been published as a preprint and just recently went back in for um, resubmission. Okay, so that's that's the data set. That's that's why I've been invited to talk to you guys. Um, and uh, uh, but you can see, so you can see the detail and the resolution that we can have now. And we uh, look forward to segmenting the tissues um, uh, better, and perhaps using all of what we learned here to make 
uh, neuromechanical models of, of flies in the future, which we can simulate in physics engines and things like that. Um, what is missing here is connections from the nervous system onto the motor neurons. Um, and the resolution here is not quite good enough for that. For that, we need this, uh, we still need electron microscopy. Um, and that's the only way we can see synapses, the connections between two neurons. And there's actually a synapse in this image here. Um, so it's right there. Um, and uh, if we zoom in a little bit more, you can see the characteristic structure of invertebrate synapses. And they have this protonaceous structure called a T-bar. Um, and right around the T-bar are these little circles. So the circles are synaptic vesicles. They're small packets of neurotransmitter. Um, and when this neuron gets excited, these neurotransmitters fuse to the membrane right near the T-bar and release their neurotransmitter packets into the gap or the synaptic cleft uh, where they, the neurotransmitter diffuses over to uh, receptors on the postsynaptic side and activates those neurons or causes a signal in the downstream postsynaptic neuron. Okay, so it's a little bit hard to see here. So maybe you can see it in this uh, stack that I'm showing you over here. So you can see this T-bar appear and disappear along with these little uh, synaptic vesicle circles. Okay, now some of you might be saying, wait a minute, stack? <laughs> I thought transmission electron microscopy was images of small slices. Um, that is true. And so I'd like to um, introduce you to one of the uh, real radical innovations of the last few years for neuroscience, which is um, serial section transmission electron microscopy. Um, and so in this uh, kind of audacious approach, uh, what's done is to fix the tissue and then to slice it in uh, very thinly and then to keep track of each section serially. And in this case, um, the, uh, the, advanced, the, the advancement was to put this on a reel-to-reel -reel tape, which each one of these little um, grids uh, containing a slice of uh, the tissue. In, in, in sequential order. Um, so this was a technique that was invented by uh, the Lickman lab at Harvard. Uh, it was first applied to uh, the, the zebrafish brain, the larval zebrafish. Um, and then Davi Bach applied this technique to the Drosophila brain. So we have a, a, a volume of the Drosophila brain. And then in this case, Jasper and Wei applied it to the locomotion uh, circuits um, that we're studying. And uh, each individual slice here took f around 5,000 images to look at. So the one field of view um, was rather small. You need 5,000 of them to tile this entire slice. And then about 4,000 slices to cover the entire volume, about 20 million images, about two to three terabytes of data uh, to cover the entire nervous system of the fly at this resolution. Um, how do you keep track of those slices? You use what's called an ultratome. Uh, this is about a centimeter across. Um, and this is a, a, an arm that slowly brings the tissue onto this diamond knife at the edge of a little well. Um, and then this grid tape is um, run through the well. The slice floats off. The slice is 45 nanometers thick, gets picked up by the grid tape, and then the next one comes. Um, and, uh, and, and it looks just like a camera, uh, the, the device enters the TEM beam, this whole contraption moves so that you can capture the entire slice and then you move on to the next one. So, whereas X-ray nano, uh, CT might be considered non-destructive, uh, technique, this is utterly destructive, <laughs> but, um, at the same time, we can go back and image these slices again at higher resolution if we want to. Um, so this has been an amazing um, technological uh, leap here, but it's coupled with the um, with the computation uh, that's needed to actually align these slices as well. So um, convolutional neural networks stretch and warp each individual slice to match them. Um, and then flood filling networks and additional CNNs are used to then segment these data. So this these methods are incredibly good now. Um, they uh, save orders of magnitude 
uh, time um, versus compared to manually tracing individual neurons, which has been tried. <laughs> um, but the segmentations are not perfect. And so what you also need are collaborative and distributed at uh, distributive and uh, distributed and um, interactive tools so that experts like me and other people in my lab can um, uh, can correct and manually proofread the segmentations that are initially uh, created. Um, and so all those methods are described in these publications. Finally, um, you need to find all the synapses in the volume. And so another convolutional neural network is trained to detect these synapses and to predict which um, neurons are postsynaptic to that synapse. Uh, and then finally, uh, you need some layer of annotation so that you can go in and say, this neuron here is a motor neuron, which it is. This one right here is a motor neuron. Um, okay, and so uh, all of those technologies were applied to our data set by the wizards um, in Zeta AI, which is a company associated with Princeton University run by Sebastian Sung, a pioneer in this field of connectomics. Um, and also by researchers at the Allen Institute for Brain Science. Um, and the same group of people um, are applying these methods to um, a millimeter by millimeter by millimeter cube of mouse cortex uh, as well. And you can go find papers on that on preprints. Okay, so using those technologies, we can turn an image like this into uh, an interactive tool like this. Um, so I've just interactively selected the neurons that were within that tiny little volume where that synapse was. And you can see how many neurons light up, the extent to which they cover the entire uh, neuropill here. And also that some neurons carry information from other neuropills into this neuropill. Okay. Um, we also were able to use, uh, you know, from this segmentation, we could count the number of neurons that are in there. And so for the VNC, there are 14,621 neurons approximately. There's about 2,000 support cells uh, or glia, and there are 69 leg motor neurons um, that we found. Okay, so these were the two data sets um, that give us different levels of resolution for both the periphery and the central nervous system. And both of these represent um, you know, decades worth of, of innovation and, um, and you know, the time has come for them. And uh, it's a very exciting time for neuroscience being able to track these, these circuits down. Um, and the next step is to try to figure out what to do with them. And so we're also excited to be um, in a position to explore what we can do. Um, the first thing that we wanted to do was to connect these two data sets. So there are no muscles in the serial section electron microscopy volume, and there are no circuits that we can recognize in the X-ray volume. So how do you connect these two? Um, so the first thing to do is to try to figure out which neuron is which. And so here are two neurons, I colored them orange and blue. And the challenge really is to say, um, which one is which, uh, which muscles do these go to? I should say um, that this segmented volume, this is the outline of the of the VNC from the EM data set. The this nervous system was taken from uh, an adult female. So we call it the female adult nerve cord or FANC. So I might refer to the FANC data set. Um, we found 69 motor neurons on the left hand side. We found 70 over on the right hand side, and we can match them left to right. So the extra one is um, is a neuron that goes out and controls the very tip of the of the leg. Uh, interestingly, this side, um, the nerve on this side was cut very close to the tissue, causing damage and causing the neurons, uh, especially the motor neurons likely to die, begin dying over here. So we found exactly half of the synapses onto uh, the neurons on this side as compared to this side. So I'm only looking at the left-hand side here. Um, as we speak, though, um, 
more data sets, more uh, nerve nervous systems are being sectioned on the the um, the ultratome and are beginning to be imaged. And these next ones will include both the brain and a ventral nerve cord together. So we will look forward to understanding how the brain feeds into these circuits. Okay, so back to the question at hand, you know, which, what makes the blue neuron different from the orange neuron? Um, okay, so to figure that out, we took advantage of yet another impressive tool for Drosophila. It's a community tool, um, and that is 10,000 different genetic strains. Each strain labels a different subset of neurons. And then uh, the creators of these tools then went in and created even sparser expression and created, uh, it took 100,000 images of, um, of sparse expression in different neurons. So they look something like this, where you can see an individual neuron um, to the point where you can recognize its morphology from uh, these light, these, these uh, confocal images, uh, fluorescence images, and uh, correspond um, and find the corresponding morphology in the fancy data set. Okay, so then through brute force, which is me actually, uh, I went through these 100,000 images, found 2,000 images of motor neurons, and 200 of which uh, look like this, where there's a single cell that's labeled that we can, can correspond. So this single cell here is associated with a genetic label, and we can bring this uh, line into our lab uh, from a, a clearinghouse that's available. It's uh, in Bloomington, Indiana, where they keep thousands and thousands of fly strains, um, and we can order them, have them shipped in, and then use uh, a reporter line, uh, in this case, green fluorescent protein, um, to label the, the neurons that are labeled by this, um, by this label, by this labeling genetic strain. So uh, Anne Sue Starr in the lab creates these beautiful images of muscle fibers and the motor neuron innervation. So we can see that this neuron um, targets the fast, ex the, 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 excuse, me, excuse me. We can see that this neuron targets the extensor muscle of the tibia. Uh, and then we can go to the X-ray data set. You can find the tibia extensor muscle um, and we can locate the two motor neurons that enter this compartment and innervate this muscle, which corresponds to two neurons in the fancy data set that, um, that look very similar to one another. And that also corresponds with the number of neurons that we know from the literature innervate this muscle. And they've been well studied in bigger insects like locusts and, and stick insects. So, these are them. One is more powerful than the other, just like the neurons that I showed you before. Um, and so we call this one the fast extensor tibia or the FETI, and this one is the slow extensor tibia or the SETI. Okay, so we ticked off two of the motor neurons, two of the 69 motor neurons that we found. Uh, and the other blue neuron that I showed you before is actually one of the neurons that I've been recording from in the past that we saw um, responses from. And so then we did the same thing for all the rest of the 69 motor neurons and assigned um, them to their target muscle. Uh, and these muscles are either in the thorax and control the coxa, or they're in the coxa and control uh, the femur position, um, et cetera. Okay, so now we have this, this projectome by combining these two data sets along with other uh, genetic tools available in Drosophila. And we have, um, we now know where that particular motor neuron goes. We can then use the fancy data set to ask which neurons make synapses onto that neuron. And so that looks like this. Oh, let me go back. So here are individual neurons that all synapse onto that one uh, extensor tibia motor neuron. All right, and then we can count up the number of synapses, and we can do that for all of the motor neurons. And we can create this connectivity matrix where each column is, a, is one of the 69 motor neurons, and each row here is a different premotor neuron, one of these different colored rainbow neurons, as my daughter calls them. Um, okay. So um, you can see from this connectivity matrix that there is a fair bit of order here, and I'll explain 
what the order is that we've applied to this, um, this connectivity matrix. So, first of all, I've grouped neurons together that um, have similar morphology. So, up here at the top are descending neurons, and these are neurons that are actually located in the brain, uh, get input there, and then bring um, an axon down into the ventral nerve cord. Um, next, there are sensory neurons coming from the periphery. Um, then there are ascending neurons that send a process back up to the brain and likely report on the status of the of the body back to the brain. There are intersegmental neurons which carry information from other neuropills that control different legs and likely coordinate interlimb uh, movements. And finally, the most numerous type of neurons are these local premotor neurons. And the local premotor neurons come in all different shapes and sizes. They make a wide range of number of synapses onto the motor neurons. And then we also found that they tend to contact um, the same motor neurons or motor neurons that share a similar function. So these are the two, this is the SETI and this is the FETI. These both extend the tibia. And all of these motor neurons make contacts onto both of the motor neurons. Um, and so we think of this as a kind of a modular structure uh, between the, the premotor neurons and the motor neurons that share a function. Um, and likewise, these neurons here are examples um, that all target the tibia flexors that I showed you before. Okay, so um, the premotor neurons connect to these motor modules and form these modular circuits. Um, if we just sum up the number of synapses down the columns, um, we can see that there's a wide range of number of synapses onto the motor neurons. And so the champion is the FETI that we've been talking about. But within these modules, so these are all neurons that uh, flex the tibia, there's a huge range in the number of inputs. So this one receives almost 40 times the number of inputs as this one here. Despite that, um, each motor neuron receives a similar fraction of input from each of these different classes. So about 60% of uh, input to each motor neuron is from these local preamends. About 25% is from these long range intersegmental or descending neurons. And only about 3% is directly from sensory neurons. So this is possibly an underestimate because the sensory neurons um, were the hardest to reconstruct in this data set. Um, but at the same time, each sensory neuron seems to make most of its output synapses onto other neurons, not motor neurons. And so we think of this as a multi-layer structure. We're looking at the last two layers, the motor neurons, their premotor neurons. The sensory information likely comes in, is processed in a different layer by other neurons in the VNC. And then that processed information is likely passed on to these premotor and motor circuits. Okay, one last thing that we can do here that takes advantage of Drosophila, knowledge about Drosophila, is to determine whether a synapse is excitatory or inhibitory. So excitatory synapses tend to make the postsynaptic neuron um, fire an action potential. And inhibitory synapses tend to pull uh, this neuron away from threshold. Uh, so you can think of it as negative and positive weights. But it's impossible to tell by eye whether a synapse is, in, is inhibitory or excitatory. But uh, it turns out in Drosophila that neurons that come from the same developmental origin, as the, as the, um, the organism grows, it develops and um, adds more neurons to the circuits. And if the neurons come from the same origin, they tend to share um, the same neurotransmitter. And the developmental origins have been identified uh, in Drosophila. Uh, and so here are a bunch of neurons that um, look very different in terms of their, their processes. But the connection back to the cell body all runs through a tiny bundle here. And this bundle is called hemilineage 13A, which suffice to say it's, um, it's one of 30 different uh, uh, developmental lines. And this one just happens to release GABA which is an, an, an inhibitory neurotransmitter. So all the synapses that you're seeing here are inhibitory. So we can do that for all of the different developmental types. Um, and what we find incredibly is that um, each motor neuron here, each column, receives about 50% of its inputs from uh, cholinergic 
that is excitatory green uh, synapses, and about 50% of its input from inhibitory red or yellow uh, uh, synapses. And in gray are neurons that we haven't quite identified yet. Um, okay, so there's a one-to-one -one balance of excitation and inhibition onto each motor neuron, despite the fact that um, this neuron here and this neuron here receive uh, wildly different amounts. This is 40 times as much input as this one. The, the relative fraction from inhibition and excitation is identical. Okay, so what else can that tell us about this matrix? So I mentioned before that um, uh, we see these modules where groups of premotor neurons tend to make connections onto all of the, uh, the motor neurons that share a particular function. But each row, each, each premotor neuron also makes synapses onto other modules. Um, and it turns out that it tends to be the excitatory neurons that do this. Um, and uh, so we measured the module preference, which is the number of synapses within the module versus the total number of synapses here. And the excitatory neurons have the lowest, um, the lowest module preference, meaning these excitatory neurons are the ones mediating these, um, uh, these, the control of two neighboring joints at the same time. Okay, so that's then uh, that's depicted here. So an individual uh, premotor neuron might connect to this module, but not to this other module, uh, whereas a different uh, premotor neuron might connect to the other module. Okay, this is um, the end of what I was going to show you about what we've learned from these two data sets. Um, as I think you can appreciate, this is really just the beginning of what we want to do. Um, and at this point, we're basically looping back around to this initial question. Now that we have these maps, what can we understand about how the nervous system controls movement? Um, and as I've shown you today, we have a lot of genetic tools that will now allow us to find individual neurons here. We will know what their connectivity is, and then we can do um, things like uh, perturb their function during behavior. So going back to these initial studies of movement by Moorbridge, we now have, um, using convolutional neural networks, um, the ability to track in 3D the detailed kinematics of leg joints um, of a fly as it's walking on these, these treadmills, and perhaps soon even in freely behaving flies. Um, and then we can um, uh, acutely activate or silence these neurons and ask um, how those uh, produce subtle changes in kinematics and um, uh, joint coordination, leg coordination, et cetera. Okay, so uh, that's what I have to show you today. I really appreciate the opportunity to, um, to talk with you all. Um, and I have to acknowledge again, all these incredible collaborators and uh, the Tuthill Lab. So thank you again. Thanks, thanks Tony, <clears throat> a very interesting talk. I have one question that is, how long did it take to generate that map at the end? You know, it, it was just several years and all these people or? Yeah, several years. Um, so the initial data, um, the initial EM data, I think um, it took about two years to get a, a volume that was correct. Uh, you had to, um, like there were there were there were a number of different nervous systems that were fixed. Um, you first had to find um, how the orientation of the nervous system was right. All that kind of prototyping, um, so that you could get nice sequential slices. All that prototyping took two years. It took only a few months to slice it. And then the imaging takes a few months as well. It was stitched together in um, steps. So the first time it was stitched together, it used uh, kind of rudimentary um, uh, spline elastic techniques. Um, and that was published in 2021, that work. Um, and initially it was traced by hand. All the motor neurons were traced by hand and it took two years to trace all the motor neurons, um, just the motor neurons. And then it was redone, so the, the entire volume was re, um, realigned. That kind of thing takes, um, you know, several days uh, now. The segmentation takes only about a week to run. 
Uh, and then the proofreading has taken a long time and we continue to do it. So you can, um, you can target the neurons that you're interested in. We found all the premotor neurons to the, you know, all the, the neurons that connect to the, to the motor neurons. And we um, uh, set aside a dedicated month to, um, to proofread those. And there, you know, the metric that we used was initially about 20% of the objects that are segmented are actually connected back to a SOMA. Um, but by the end of that month, we had connected about 70% of the objects back to a SOMA. Um, so that gives you an indication of how quickly it's going. And then after that, it took another four months to get to the point where we have um, this whole data set. Uh, so each stage, yeah, has taken uh, quite a bit of time. <laughs> a lot of patience. Right. <laughs> a lot of excitement too, though. Uh, do we have other questions? I was wondering in one of your, um, I'll ask another one. In one of your plots, you had sort of these lines above it. Was that identifying peaks, I think, in the data? At first, it almost looked like a barcode. And then. This one? No, it was much earlier than this one. No. Oh, oh, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, you kind uh, of had like a spectrum or some kind of plot. And then above it, it looked like, you know, I was guessing that maybe they were identifying peaks. Yes, we were looking at peaks. That's right. I'm sorry. Uh, I don't quite know how to exit out of this to go back in a. No, that's okay. Yep, that, you passed it. Yeah, that one. Yeah. Um, yeah. So um, this is the membrane potential of this weak kind of slow neuron here. And you can see these tiny little peaks on top of that. And those are the action potentials for this particular cell. Um, the size of the action potential at the point where you measure it. Um, has a lot to do with um, the electrical structure of the neuron. And so these slow, these small cells have high resistance between the cell body and where we think the action potential is actually generated. So for the signal to get back to the cell body, um, it has to go through this, um, this resistor, which causes um, the, the signal to uh, become much smaller by the time it gets back to your measuring device. So you can see these big swings in um, the membrane potential, but then on top of it, you see these tiny little spikes. Mm -hmm. You can you can detect them pretty well with filtering. So there's I think there's a there's a low pass filter, then there's a high pass filter, and then there's a a shape uh, matching procedure. Um, and uh, I mean that's what it is. I wrote it, but um, <laughs> and then you can detect these little these these peaks here, and so they're indicated as these tick marks here. In this case, a slightly different routine was um, done to detect these peaks, but um, yeah, exactly. Um, I mean, one thing that I'll point out here um, is that, that mystifies us. So this is one of the things that we're kind of interested in is here you see that this neuron is the only one that's firing and that's when there's not much movement. And then as soon as it begins to uh, get faster, then you start to see the recruitment of this second neuron, which we know produces more force. And then the interesting part is over here, you actually get more impulses in the, um, in the stronger one than in the slower one. Um, and so this kind of um, the shift from the slow one to the intermediate neuron is uh, the job of these premotor circuits. And um, we're trying to understand you know, under what under what conditions you would go from recruiting the slow one first to recruiting the other one faster, and which premotor circuits are involved? So, did um, I I don't know if I misread. Maybe it's a slide before this that the slow, the force output for the slow depends on uh, if you send you know several pulses in succession. Is that the case? Uh, yeah. So yeah, this uh, one. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so here, this slow neuron is quite weak. So we can't, we can't actually pick up the movement of the, we can't detect the movement of the force probe in response to a single spike here. So this is an extrapolation mm. back to one spike. Um, so it's usually spiking, yeah. So do you, do you know, I guess this is maybe a kind of a wild question, but <laughs> do you know if the if the insect itself tries to, you know, vary the number of spikes to 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 you know 
put more or less force out, or is this just kind of a very sloppy uh, mechanism? And sometimes you get ten, and sometimes you get twelve, and there's kind of no in, intention to to modulate that force output. Um, it's a great question. Um, we don't know how precise they are. Yeah. Uh, what, what you can see is that um, when they're doing this kind of thing, and when they're moving their their tibia around. They almost never fire the very big one. Um, the oh. very biggest neuron is almost never, it, it depolarizes. So you see something that looks like this, but then there's no spike on top of it. Only in very rare cases does it spike. Probably because it produces a ton of force. And um, if you accidentally recruit that neuron, all of a sudden you're, you know, yeah. your walking is all thrown off. Right. Um, how precise it is, we'd like to know. Uh, so I actually, <laughs> Uh, that's that's the next project using uh, the maps that we have here. Um, we're going to um, study the circuits, different circuits. The behavior that we're going to um, analyze is this learned behavior. So we can actually uh, punish the fly with an aversive stimulus, and we can teach the fly to produce a certain amount of force on the tibia to turn off the stimulus, and then the fly will actually produce that amount of force. Um, and we, we got it working. We received a grant to work on it. And, um, and then we did all this stuff. Uh, yeah, we got the grant about 2 years ago. Uh, and so now it's time to return to that experiment. So we can answer that exact question. Okay, great. Thank you. <laughs> okay, thanks again, Tony. I really appreciate it. Very interesting talk. I love how you pull all this data, a lot of data fusion and a lot of stuff that we do as well as taking different measurement techniques, fusing that data, having to segment, having to sort what's true, what's not in that iteration and stuff like that is really interesting. And a very different scale. Right. <laughs> yeah, a lot of signal detection, a lot of um, uh, um, ROC analysis kind of stuff. Um, I didn't mention a lot of that here, um, but that will be in the, in the paper that we're about to publish, so, or try to publish. But yeah, yeah, no, exactly. Well, I learned a lot of this stuff at LLNL um, looking for, yeah, so I, I was working on a project that was um, imaging um, out of focus, the optics and out of focus. And so you could see diffraction rings in these, um, in these images. They were, they, they were supposedly um, small cracks or, or, um, or uh, uh, you know, problems with a, a lens upstream and the project was called finding rings in damaged objects uh, in damaged optics which was which was frodo <laughs> so, <laughs> typical lab stuff but yeah <laughs> roc analysis image segmentation true false positives etc yeah was that with laura uh kegelmeyer or laura? yeah yeah exactly and barry oh, uh, okay yeah, <laughs> yeah very interesting well, thanks again. I was really enjoyed your talk and uh, nice seeing you, your sister and, and your um, mom and dad. Thank you, Harry. Thank you, everybody. Really appreciate it. Thanks, Tony. Thank you. Thanks for the invite.